Um, for most of you, hopefully most of you are regulars now to our Space Frontiers lectures. My name is David Alexander. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to the third of this session's uh, Space Frontiers lectures. Um, as usual, I'd like to thank the people who make it happen, um, the people who provide I probably get tired of this job, but I pay for the cheese and money. But it's Dan Carson from the School of Natural Sciences over here, the Dean of the School of Natural Sciences. And Pat, Pat Reif, who's sitting here at the front, who's the director of the Rice Space Institute. Um, so, you know, it helps to have all that kind of backing and support. And then there's the people who do the work. They're never here for me to thank them because they're outside. That's Pamela and Emily, and they, they just make everything happen. Um, as most of you know, the goal of the, the Space Frontiers lectures is basically to increase the awareness of the role of space exploration across our campus. So I hope, hopefully there's some, any Rice students here? Thank you, good. And there's no extra credit this year, so that's, 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 that's good. Um, so the idea is to increase the awareness of the different uh, impacts that space exploration has on our science, our engineering, but also our society and culture. Um, and so, for instance, our last lecture, we were talking about the impact on religious thought and religious imagination. We'll follow this up with two lectures in the spring. One um, is from an astronomer talking about the discovery of Earth-like planets and the potential for life on other planets within the universe. Um, that will be in February. And we'll be hearing from, about the results from the Kepler mission. And then in March, we're hearing from an anthropologist um, talking about the capitalization of space. And, and that ought to be... Um, Interesting, I'll be in March, so those are the two remaining ones. And before I introduce our very special speaker tonight, um, I'd like to extend a special welcome to a couple of groups of budding future astronauts here. Um, you may have seen some folks running around with yellow jerseys and, and looking like uh, uh, the, the, uh, the very advanced students and up, but up here we have the mighty Jaguars. <laughs> Team in case of <laughs> we also have some other uh, uh, second grade girls and their families from Westview Elementary. Um, if you'd like to say hi, hey Sophia, Zoe, I'm all very shy. I'm not, I tell you, they're not shy in their lives. And then there's also um, the West University fifth grade, obviously the mind group here as well. Yeah. Uh, they're definitely not shy. Um, it's really, it's particularly relevant that we have so many young folk here because as you know, we focus on what's going on in the space business just now, but it's not what happens tomorrow, it's what happens in 10, 20, 50 years from now that really makes the difference. And that's why I think what we're doing here tonight is, is particularly um, relevant for these younger people, but also, um, you know, for the, for the rice students here too, there's a lot, a lot of stuff to be done. Um, how many people here have been in space? <laughs> and, I, and I don't mean I, I don't mean you watch every single episode of Star Trek. Uh, we created a lunar module in SimCity. Um, some these days it's hard to tell the difference, but today only about 523. If I've got my numbers right, only about 523 people have gone into orbit or gone into space, and of those, only 54 of them have been women. And if you're good at math you realize that the Earth's population just hit 7 billion. So the chances of bumping into an astronaut by accident, or just by chance, is about 1 in 13 million. The chances of bumping into a female astronaut by chance is about 1 in 130 million. Um, in Houston, the odds are a little bit better. <laughs> um, but what it does tell you is that they're a very, very rare group of individuals. It takes quite a lot to be an astronaut. Um, unfortunately, you have to be a bit shorter than I am. Um, for the spacesuits, but um, that's an old complaint of mine. Um, <laughs> but it's a very rare, rare group of people that do this and do it well, and um, you know, and the, the, what they give back to society um, is just phenomenal. Um, and we have one of those people with us, someone who, as I've said here, is truly one person in 130 million. Um, Dr. Shannon Walker is a graduate of Westbury Senior High here in Houston. And we're more than proud to say a three-time graduate of Rice University, where she got her BA in physics, master's degree, and her PhD in space physics from what was then the space physics group, the first uh, space physics department uh, at a university in this country. Um, Dr. Walker, Walker served as a flight controller for several shuttle missions before taking time out to basically 
you know, just come and do a degree, a PhD, you know, when you get bored at NASA, you come and do a PhD in Rice. Um, but uh, after doing a PhD where she worked on the solar winds effect and the, the Deutian atmosphere, um, she went back to NASA and worked in the International Space Station program in 1995, I believe, is when that started. And as part of that, she spent a year in Moscow working with the Russian Space Agency. She was selected to the astronaut corps in 2004 and completed her training two years later. Her work with the space station has earned her several awards, including seven group achievement awards and nine performance awards, bonus uh, performance awards. Dr. Walker flew to the International Space Station uh, on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. That's something that we'll all be coming, becoming more familiar with in the next few years. And tonight, Dr. Walker will discuss what it takes to prepare for a long duration space flight and share the experiences of her time aboard the ISS. And before I ask you to welcome Dr. Walker, I'd like to invite Professor Pat Reif up um, for a little presentation. <laughs> well, those of you who came in a little bit early, uh, we, we showed uh, a clip, uh, which is on the Rice YouTube channel, uh, of the uh, Rice Purdue game, where at halftime, the mob uh, made a two-thirds scale size uh, model of the International Space Station. Um, and so those of you who <clears throat> have a pen and pencil, you can write down the YouTube link. Or those of you who have a iPhone can, can snap it and, and get to it. So I'll leave that here. Uh, so uh, Shannon, uh, being not only a, uh, uh, an alum of the Space Physics and Astronomy Department, but she's also an alum of the Rice uh, Marching Owl Band, or MOB, as they are called. And so uh, we showed while people were gathering the video of her performance from Russia playing Louie Louie with the mob. Probably the first ever that that's ever happened. Uh, but of course, because she was in Russia at the time, she couldn't see it. So this is a DVD of oh, your performance. Awesome. <laughs> write down the, the link or, or snap it with your iPhone and, uh, and, uh, and, and pull up. So you are now Thank you. famous for doing Louie Louie yeah. from Russia. Right. <laughs> oh, this is great. Anyway, we're delighted to have you back and I'll give you back today. Thank you. Well, just Thanks. please join us in, in welcoming U.S. astronaut Dr. Shannon Walker. Thank you. Fair. This is basically my home movies and pictures and things from my time in training. But it gives a good sense of what it takes to uh, prepare for a long duration space flight and then what it's like once you get there. And as uh, David Alexander mentioned, I did not fly on this. I did not fly on the shuttle. I'm one of the few people uh, that um, ended up, well, initially uh, flew on the Russian Soyuz rocket like you see here. We're going to be doing that more and more, uh, well, exclusively for the time being until we get our own uh, rockets back in this country, but um, I actually never had the pleasure of flying on the shuttle even having, after having worked in the shuttle program and in the space business at NASA for well over 20 years. So, um, but still, the Soyuz is a great way to travel to and from. The only problem with the Soyuz, um, well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, the thing about long duration space flight is uh, long duration applies not to the amount of time that you spend in orbit, but how long it takes to prepare to get there. Um, an average shuttle flight uh, training will take roughly a year. For a long duration flight, it takes about three years. And so uh, you spend a lot of time in a lot of different spots around the world. Um, it takes three years because you are, these days, learning a foreign spacecraft. You have to know the Russian language and you have to do a lot of time in Russia. Uh, in fact, I spent well over half my training time, um, over a year and a half of that time, in Russia. And so this is a lot what it looked like to me most of the time when I was over there, uh, being a native Houstonian uh, who's used to the warmth and the humidity. Adjusting to this was not easy at all. It's dark, it's cold, 
uh, and as far as I'm concerned, it's pretty miserable. And there we are um, walking to class one day. For, uh, for, the, for the young folks here, um, when you first start out training to, to be an astronaut, and when you first start out training for admission, a lot of the time you spend is just like going to school. You are in a classroom. You have an instructor that's teaching you various things. In our case, it's all the systems of the space station and all the systems of the Soyuz. And if you flew on the shuttle, all the systems of the, of the shuttle. So um, you spend a lot of time in classes, and you do have to take tests. And it's very interesting. In the US, uh, the tests are a little bit, um, I would say not quite as rigorous, but in Russia the tests are very rigorous and they're all oral and you do do them in a foreign language. So it, it's, pretty, um, it's pretty daunting to do that. But when you're done with the tests and when you're done with the, the classroom part of the training, you actually spend a lot of time in simulators. And this here is a picture of the Soyuz simulator where I spent a great deal of my life. I'm um, seated next to uh, Sasha Skortsov who I spent um, um, about three quarters of my training flow. He ended up flying. Uh, one increment ahead of me, but we spent a lot of time together. That's the Soyuz uh, simulator on the left, and then that's a picture of us on the inside. And you can see the Soyuz is not a very large place to be. I would say it's about the size of a, I don't know these days, a Mini Cooper or something. So you don't have a lot of room, and that actually is a lot bigger, which you'll see at the very end of the presentation of how much room we actually have in there. Um, luckily for me, that all the training in, uh, that I did for Russia wasn't actually in Russia. Uh, you have to learn all the Soyuz systems, you have to know about these things, but um, one of the things that's, that's paramount when you're training um, and when you're living on station is being aware of safety. There are a few uh, very severe emergencies that, that, are, that are quite critical, and so we spend a lot of time um, exercising safety precautions, and one of the things that we do actually is go down to uh, Ukraine and on the, off the southern coast of Ukraine and spend time um, learning emergency procedures. If we had an emergency on the station, we would get into our Soyuz spacecraft and we would come home. Uh, because it's an emergency situation, the landing would not be planned and you wouldn't know exactly where in the world you may end up, which could be in the middle of the ocean. So if you land in the middle of the ocean, you've got to be able to prepare yourself to get out of that Soyuz spacecraft and be safe in the ocean. So you have to, in this little bitty uh, ball, and you can see it there, it's the, uh, the yellow the yellow ball, or the orange ball there is, 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 the, is the Soyuz, as an actual uh, Soyuz spacecraft that we, uh, that actually never flew, but that's what we practice in. You get inside, you have to be able to change your clothes and get into your, your safety gear and then get out. And so it's, it's, it's quite a bit of a, a challenge to do that. And we're there at the end of summer, so it was actually quite hot. So you can see it was, it was pretty hot at the end, but uh, you get all of these clothes and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, it is a challenge. And ultimately what you need to do is to be able to uh, get out of the Soyuz and be safe, and so you, you fall back into the, into the water, and, and the trainers are there to <clears throat> make sure we don't hurt ourselves, but you then go bobbing around in the ocean and wait for somebody, hopefully soon, to come pick you up. Uh, and if they're going to pick you up, since you're in the middle of the ocean, they're going to pick you up uh, from a helicopter. So I was thinking, great, how exciting would that be to now <coughs> being picked up by a helicopter, you know, come on over, let's see what we can do. But they didn't actually let us do it there. They uh, took us back to Star City and they hoisted us up on a crane from the ceiling. But it was still pretty neat. You got a good feel for um, what it's like if you actually had to be picked up out of the water from a helicopter. So that was some, some interesting training that we did that, that's a nice break from sitting in a classroom or sitting in a simulator all the time. Another thing we did in Russia, which I think is great, and unfortunately we do not do that here in this um, country, is we actually get to practice in a centrifuge, um, which mimic the G loads that we will experience during the launch and the landing. So the um, blue thing on the left there is the centrifuge in Russia. The picture on the right is the apparatus that you were in when they stick you inside a centrifuge. And um, this is what it's like. It doesn't look like it's going very fast, but um, I experienced, I don't know, at 1.8.5 or 9 Gs when we're doing this training. And it, it's, it, it's really neat. One of the things, one of the um, tests that we do, we actually do a lot of practical tests in Russia too. And since I was trained as the co-pilot, one of my duties on the, on the Soyuz was if we had um, a problems, <coughs> oh, um, problems um, coming in with the systems, we could actually, uh, normally we fly in automatically, but we can take over and fly it manually. And so I was trying to actually fly a manual entry. And so one of the things I do is in that centrifuge, fly the Soyuz, and that centrifuge <coughs> actually reacts to the inputs that I'm giving. So it, it is the ultimate video game where you can actually feel um, what you would be experiencing in the world. A lot of fun. 
Uh, the other thing, um, here's another shot of us in the simulator, but we're in our pressure suits. These are the suits we wear for uh, a launch and for an entry. They are for our protection to, to uh, if we had a problem and the Soyuz capsule lost all its atmosphere, these suits would, would uh, protect us because they have a, uh, their own air supply. Well, the spacecraft has its own air supply hooked up to the spacesuits. So we actually practice in these a lot. And the reason we do, one, um, you have a little bit less space in the Soyuz spacecraft when you're all suited up in your big bulky suit. Um, but also when you have your gloves on and when you have your helmet closed, it, it's quite a different beast to try and do what you need to do. It's a lot easier, trust me, to be in regular clothes and be trying to push buttons on the panel. But if I'm all strapped in, uh, I can't even reach the panel. Please. That is me on the the far side with the little stick poking the buttons because I can't reach because I am strapped into my seat. So it's good to practice that before you actually get in the rocket and take off. Um, so that was, you know, in a nutshell what we did in Russia. I spent a lot of time in other parts of the world. That uh, uh, simulator on the left is actually the European Space Agency. The one on the right is in the, uh, at the Japanese Space Agency. You'll see they all look uh, suspiciously the same. They're kind of round. Um, as because they all launch on the shuttle and the shuttle payload bay has that shape and that is why the shape of the station is the way it is. All its components had to feel, uh, that were launched on the shuttle had to fit in the shuttle payload bay. Uh, so yes, I did spend time in Europe, I spent time in Japan, I spent time in Canada doing uh, their training with their robotic arm and then of course I spent a lot of time in the U.S. obviously um, because the U.S. has a lot of components and it has a lot of experiments that we need to do. One of the benefits of training in the U.S. is the spacewalk training that we do. Um, that, that happens here for Americans. Um, so that picture there is me getting Tracy Caldwell Dyson, one of my crewmates, suited up, ready to go for uh, some of her training. Um, you get into these bulky suits, you get lowered into a giant swimming pool, and then, um, then you actually, uh, we do our training in the swimming pool. And you may think, well, why are we doing it in a swimming pool? Well, we do it in a swimming pool because you can weigh yourself out to be neutrally buoyant and you can sort of mimic the effects of zero gravity. Um, it does a pretty good job and you can have a very good model of the space station to work on. So we do that a lot. Um, the things that, that doesn't really do well, um, you have uh, you know, drag effects from, from the space suit so it is a little bit harder to move around, a little bit harder to move around in the water than it is outside. Um, but, uh, and you also actually do obviously feel gravity, so if you're on your head in the swimming pool, you feel like you're on your head, whereas on the, in space it doesn't feel like you're up, upside down or anything. And you can see, um, that's me in the suit, and you can see how small my head looks in the, um, in the helmet there, and, and I just have to say, yeah, those suits are big, they were not made for people my size, and so it is a bit of a challenge um, for, for someone like me to operate in them. Um, in fact, on, on land, if you're not in the swimming pool, those suits by themselves weigh a couple hundred pounds. So that's a lot of mass to, to move around. So you've got to be in good shape and um, reasonably strong physically to do um, spacewalks. Another thing we do in conjunction with spacewalk training, this was actually a lot of fun. Um, when you're in the suits, in the water, uh, like I said, I mentioned the effects of, of drag, and so you you're, don't get the full effect of what it's really like to operate turning bolts and, and installing equipment uh, on the outside. Because one of the key things you always have to do is to brace yourself. If you, uh, those that are familiar with physics, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if you torque a bolt one way, you're going the other way. So what we do actually is they hook us up in this harness and hang us from the ceiling. They hang us from the ceiling a lot. And seems like, but they hang us from the ceiling and they give us these tools and then you got to go figure out how you would actually hold your body and hang on to things to get uh, a lot of the work done. And it, it is a bit challenging and, and it's, a good, it's a good exercise to do because you, um, you know, it's important to get things done if you're going to take the trouble of going out on a spacewalk, you need to be efficient at what you're doing. Another uh, aspect of spacewalk training is actual uh, virtual reality. That is me in a whole virtual reality headset gear there. And what I'm doing um, is, is practicing um, flying a little jet pack to get back to the station. Uh, as part of the spacesuits, we do have um, a little jet pack that, that has got um, uh, little jets on it. So if you actually accidentally came off the station, 
if you were out there doing a spacewalk and you started floating away, which you shouldn't because we're always tied to the station, it, at least uh, one, one way, usually twice if, if you're smart about it. But if you happen to come off, we do have the jetpack to be able to fly back. And it, and it can be a little tricky, especially if you're far away and you're rotating, so you've got to figure out how to, how to steady yourself, turn back to the station, and then actually fly. And, and yes, orbital mechanics does make a difference if you're above it or below. So um, it is, it is uh, hard but fun and necessary. Again, safety is always paramount. Um, other than that, a lot of time with the instructors. Uh, I put this picture in there because you, I'm there with my, the picture on the right with my, um, my colleague Doug Wheelock. He and I flew in the Soyuz together along with one of our uh, Russian counterparts. And I like this one because it just shows how exhausted we are. After three years of, of going around the world, uh, you are jet lagged, you are tired, and at this point, I think both of us were ready to just let's just go, just stop talking to me. I've got it. I'll do it fine in space. Let's just let's just be done with the training thing because three years is actually quite a long time. But no, we have to do more training. We spend a lot of time in the simulators there. Uh, on the right, uh, Doug and Fyodor, who is the uh, third person there, and the third person with us in the Soyuz, are doing some medical training. That's another big thing. If we have a medical emergency on the station, uh, you can't just go out to the doctor's office. You've got to take care of it yourself to at least get somebody stabilized and then figure out, uh, can you solve the problem up there? And if it's serious enough, then you would get to the Soyuz and come home. So, so we learn all, all manner of CPR and that can, uh, you know, stitch you up, I can give you shots, I can give you IVs, I can even give you a catheter, but uh, nobody wants. <laughs> so, uh, more safety training. Fires, fires on station, very serious. Uh, we do everything we can in terms of the materials that we choose to fly, that we make the station out of, that we make the payloads out of, and everything to um, minimize the risk of fires. But if we did happen to have one, and they have had them on the, the uh, Russian near space station, we have not had one on the, uh, the International Space Station, you got to be able to take care of it yourself. You cannot open a window to let the smoke out. Um, so we actually have training where they pump smoke into our modules that in, the, in the U.S. and we practice uh, dealing, dealing with the fire. Not a, I mean, we don't actually physically put it out, but it is a bit uh, trickier to when, there, when you have no lights in there to figure out where you need to go and, and get your emergency uh, protection on your, your, um, your gas mask and, and find your fire extinguisher to put things out. So a lot of fun. Um, I actually, this was fun. This is Sasha and I. We're having a fun session. We actually get to do food tasting. Um, we get to try all the food. I'm not honestly sure why we get to do food tasting because we don't actually get to pick the food we get to eat up there. We have a standard menu that rotates every 16 days or so, but they let us taste it all before we go, so we have a pretty good feel of what to expect once we get up there. So that was one of our, our lighter moments after those three years of training. And once we're all trained up and ready to go, they say, okay, we're going to let you go, so the, we fly over to Russia, do the last bit of training there, and we go into Kazakhstan. We actually launch out of Kazakhstan. That's where the, launch, the Russian launch facilities are. Um, Kazakhstan was part of the former Soviet Union, and that's where uh, their launch pads were built, and so that's where we go. It is a, a big open desert. You can see that there's not a whole lot around us um, before we land there in Kazakhstan, and it's, there's not much there except for launch facilities and a few camels, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Um, one of the things we do when we get there, we actually get to do what's called a fit check. We get into our real Sokol suits, our, our pressure suits, they're called Sokol suits. Um, we get into our actual Soyuz spacecraft, and that is our actual spacecraft behind us. We get to go in, we get to sit down, we get to make sure that everything is as we expect it to be. You know, is it, is it familiar? Do we have everything laid out once they get all the, uh, the, um, the cargo in there? You know, can we still function and do what we need to do? So that's actually a pretty important thing they do for us um, in Kazakhstan. Now, I should point out here that the shuttle, when it launched, it would go out to the launch pad at least a month, may usually longer, before uh, the shuttle launch. The, the crew wouldn't be able to get into it any time close up to your launch. Uh, the cargo has been in it for a very, very long time. It's just sitting out there having checks done on it, getting ready to go. Soyuz, we go down to Kazakhstan 11 days before uh, we launch. We're in quarantine there, just like the astronauts uh, that launch on the shuttle were in quarantine. But get this, three days before a launch, 
they put that Soyuz capsule that you saw in the vertical, they attach it to the rocket that is in another building, they attach it to the rocket, they stick it on a train, and they train it out to the launch pad. Um, that's pretty impressive. Uh, this actually is a, I like this shot, this is uh, of course the business end of the, the Soyuz there, it's all the, the engines that um, get us into space. And we've got one central core engine there that actually has four engine bells and then four strap-on boosters and then another third stage engine um, that's at the top. So they train it out a couple days before launch, they rotate it into the vertical and then it's ready to go. So once it's ready to go, once ready, we're ready to go, we actually get into our suit one last time for real, um, and then we head out to the launch pad. So this is, uh, so our launch was about 3.30 in the morning, so this is in the middle of the night, this is probably about midnight, that we're coming out and we're doing the same walk that Yuri Gagarin did, the first uh, person that flew into space. You go out as a crew, you present yourself to Russian management, and say, yes, we're ready to go. They say, okay, put you on the ladder, get you into the Soyuz, and then uh, a few hours later, you're taking off. Let's see. Thought there would be sound with this, maybe not. Okay, so just imagine big war of engines, because it's actually pretty impressive. Uh, there's a lot of vibrations. Um, it's a very bright, uh, you know, very, very, very bright. This looks like it's in the middle of the day. It's not, it's just how bright a launch is when you're watching it from the ground. Um, Eight and a half minutes, we're actually in space. Those are my, the crewmates that are on the station waiting for us to come up. They were watching us. This is uh, Fyodor and myself uh, in the Soyuz doing our um, part of our rendezvous profile. Um, it takes two days, or they plan it for two days to get from your launch to the space station. That just has to do with orbital mechanics and rendezvous profiles. Anyway, so this is, this is the view that we have on our windows as we're approaching the station. It's absolutely beautiful. It's big, it's huge. It's, it's gorgeous. Uh, we slowly uh, maneuver to it. We're using this, this information here to guide ourselves in. We dock and then um, a few hours later after we equalize all the, the pressures between the hatches, we open it up and we get to see our friends that we haven't seen in a, in a few months. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting affair. So now we're there. We're on station. Our training is done. So what we do once we're on the space station? Well, we do all <coughs> kinds of things, um, all manner of science, um, and a lot of uh, maintenance and housekeeping and, and things that the ground needs us to do. Oh, I guess I should talk about first who was there with us. Six people on station while I was there. Uh, three Russians, three Americans. That's t typically the standard complement, although on, on the um, U.S. side, we also share our um, flights with the Canadians, the Japanese, and the Europeans. So um, always three Russians and then a mix on, on the rest of us. So these are the three Russians that I was up there with. On the upper left is Misha Pernyenko. On the bottom left is Sasha Skortsov, the person I did most of my training with. And then that's Fyodor, who I actually launched with. And then there's Tracy. Uh, she was the one in the, the spacesuit training. And then um, there's Doug, who launched with me on the Soyuz. So in space, um, this is this is me and Tracy um, moving a rack from the ceiling to the floor. Uh, the ground said we need to move this rack. We said okay. I'm not to this day entirely clear why we need to do it, but it worked into some sort of overall scheme that the ground needed to be done. Um, you can see that when you're moving stuff in space, of course, you don't actually need to stand on the floor. You can stand on the walls. You can stand on the ceiling. Uh, moving things is is quite easy. Uh, that probably weighed, I don't know, a couple hundred pounds, and it's just very easy to move around and stick it where you need to go. Um, other things we did, let's see, I did a lot of science. Most of the stuff we do up there, since of course the space station is about science, a lot of science in this experiment. I'm actually, I kid you not, watching bubbles move in fluid. Um, it does sound a little tedious, it is, and in my view, it's not like watching grass grow, but it's important uh, fluid mechanics science um, that needs to be done, so, so I did do it. I think the hardest part for me was the, the um, scientists on the ground wanted me to provide a running commentary, and it's, believe me, it's not like doing a horse race or something. This bubble is slowly moving up. Um, a lot of other science, I was a test subject for a lot of things, a lot of the biological sciences were always investigating the, the details and the nuances of how the body uh, reacts in space. We know the big picture, we know about bone loss, we know about muscle, muscle loss, but we want to understand the mechanisms at the cellular level. So uh, as a test subject, I ended up taking a lot of um, samples, a lot of blood, a lot of urine that we all collected, and then we would stick it into the freezer. That's that um, cold-looking thing that I've got 
uh, in my hands on the left there. We'd stick it in the freezer, and then once a vehicle was going to the ground, be it a shuttle or uh, sometimes a soil use, we send the samples to the ground, and then the, um, then the, uh, the scientists can analyze whatever it is they're looking for. And it actually pretty, is pretty impressive what they can tell about how the body works based on what is or isn't in your blood or urine. Um, a lot of times, too, this is, this is me assembling an experiment. It was in a glove box, so I close it all up. I got it all ready to go. Then it was operated from the ground. A lot of the science is actually operated from the ground. We don't uh, necessarily do it ourselves. The ground would run this, and every few days, I would go back in and change out the samples, and they could do the next uh, experiment run that they were doing. Uh, more science. This is a Japanese one. This is actually a better view of it. So in this case, I, we were actually looking at how plants grow and how roots um, would want to either go towards a good water source or go away from a bad water source. So I'm, I'm incubating some, uh, some cucumber seeds, uh, sticking it into, um, actually in this case I'm sticking it into a centrifuge because we had a control case where we mimic, mimic gravity knot. And yeah, if it doesn't, you know, if you can't get to it, you can just move. Um, and this one, this is fun, this was an experiment done for MIT. They are actually um, are looking at the motion control of satellites, and so we had these little balls in the space station that we got to fly around and actually do races with and things like that. So it was fun, but you know, it was all good information on how how you can control bodies in space. When we weren't doing science, we did actually get some time off. We were pretty busy up there, um, so of course we spent a lot of time looking out the window. This is a view from uh, the cupola, um, the, the cupola module that we have. Uh, this is over the Bahamas, and um, the colors are absolutely amazing. I can't, I can't describe, and the pictures don't do it justice on how deep and rich and vibrant the colors are that you see of the Earth from space, uh, especially the colors of the sunrises and sunsets. I mean, there's just um, no way to, to capture it. It's, it's amazingly beautiful. Um, we were up there, I was up there over the summer, I was up there from June to November, and it was a very, very active hurricane season, so we got lots of, lots of uh, pictures of the hurricane, I think uh, all the hurricanes, this I think is Igor uh, in the Atlantic, but the, those are very impressive. You can see, you know, on one hand, it just looks uh, sort of calm, but once you get close to the eye of the hurricane, you can see um, all its um, destructive power, so hurricanes are impressive to see. We actually had a lot of um, forest fires, going on that summer. It was a, a hot and dry summer. A lot of parts of the world had, or, or not, and not just in forests, but just fires everywhere, a lot in uh, Colorado and the central US. And so this is what a fire looks like to us. You can see the plume as it moves um, across the countryside based on the wind. That's pretty neat. At night, the Earth is amazing at night, too, because you can see where the cities are, you can see where the cities aren't, and I always find that interesting too, where, where people tend to settle and where they don't settle. Um, and I always found amazing how much lightning is going on across the planet at night, especially across Africa, it really is impressive. Um, this, so I you know, won't make you guess what it is, this is actually the, the Nile River up in Egypt. So you can see where people settle, they settle very close to the Nile River. Um, so it is, it is pretty neat. Um, one of the things that we actually saw a lot of, and I cannot claim credit for this picture, but the aurora in space. It is very impressive, it is, it is uh, beautiful, and actually cameras in this case do, do a little bit better at, at capturing the colors than, than you can see with your naked eye. But this is a view out the cupola. Those two spacecraft there, one's a Soyuz, the front one is a Soyuz, and the after one is a Progress uh, supply ship. Um, really neat. That was taken by the crew that's currently on the station now. And this actually is time-lapse photography of Aurora going across the night side. You can see the solar, uh, one of our solar arrays moving, but um, just the, the dancing of the lights is just so impressive to see. And actually, it's pretty unusual. Usually, they are much farther in the distance, so having it go right underneath the space station is, is pretty impressive. I wish I could claim that too, but that was also taken by the folks on the station right now. And then this is a good shot, so a lot of times you get asked, and we get asked, can you see stars? Yes, you can see stars, and like, most of the time they don't show up in pictures just because of the way the cameras are set. But you do, you do see lots of stars. You see so many more stars than you can see um, from the ground, and, and you can see the things like the Milky Way very clearly in, in space, and so it's, it's quite beautiful. And then you can see there um, the Atmosphere. You can see how thin the atmosphere is. It is amazingly thin, and that's one thing that really struck me about being in space: how thin the atmosphere is. And it just gave um, gave me a sense of how fragile uh, the Earth is. So we've got to do good to take care of it. 
Um, after about four months, it was time for Tracy and Sasha and Misha, who's not in this picture, to go home. So we said goodbye to our colleagues and friends. They got into their soyas, they came home, and two weeks later we had a new crew of three come up. Uh, we had Sasha uh, Kaleri, who's on the left, Scott Kelly, American, and then Oleg Skripichka, another Russian. So we were back to our full complement of six people on the station, three Russians, three Americans. Um, now I wanted to give you a sense of what it's actually like to live on space station. So we did all the science, we did all looking out the window, but where do we actually live? Um, this is a shot of four of us. These are our little crew compartments that we're poking our heads out of. We um, live in one of the modules of the space station. This is on the US segment. And you can see that the modules are um, spaced around, you know, on the floor, on the ceiling, and on the walls, because it doesn't matter. You don't have gravity, so it just doesn't matter where you are and where you sleep at night. Um, we all have sleeping bags that are on what is the equivalent of our wall in our, our crew compartment. And, um, and we actually have a, um, a laptop in there where we can do email, where we can actually do a, a voiceover internet protocol and, and call home if we want to call our friends and family. Um, so it's a little little space you can call your own, but it is about the size of a, I don't know, a phone booth. It's not very big. It's not much bigger than you see there, but it is nice. Uh, meal time on the station. This is us sort of getting together to have a meal. This is a table we in the on the U.S. side. I know these pictures aren't the best, but you can see. Um, how we eat, which we gather around the table together at night because a lot of times the station actually is so big you don't spend a lot of time with your crewmates. So it was nice to come together at dinner and um, talk about your day or talk about whatever's going on. And this is from the second half of my flight. Um, uh, food, food is, it is mostly dehydrated um, or it comes from the military. So those of you that are familiar with MREs, most ready to eat, um, we do eat a lot of that food and I can assure you after um, six months, it gets very, very monotonous, ready for a change. Um, one thing, living on station, just like living on the earth, you cannot escape housework. We have to clean the station every weekend. Uh, we have to vacuum our filters, and this is what I'm doing here. I'm actually vacuuming all the filters in the Japanese module. Um, this is a little sped up, but you can see how complicated actually vacuuming can be in space. Uh, I have to actually hold the vacuum cleaner with my knees because the cord is so strong, the electrical cord, it would pull me back to the place where it was plugged in. So I have to hold on to that so I can hold on to the module with one hand and then actually vacuum with the other hand. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge to do some of the things that come very easy in daily life here. Let's see what's next. Oh uh, yeah, so we did goof off. We had time. We had time on the weekends when we maybe weren't as scheduled as much. And so I had some bungees stretched out across uh, one of the uh, spaces in the floor so we would sort of bounce and, and have fun. And this is, this is one thing that Doug and I never, ever, ever got right. I think uh, we actually had a, I don't know, a mass problem or something. He would always be just fine and he was always slinging me off into some other direction. So even though we didn't get it, we did make sure we practiced it a lot just to, just to make sure. And here I'm trying to do a talk to the ground and there's Doug and Tracy doing the same thing in the background, sort of messing up. And, um, and this is uh, Tracy and I. Tracy actually sings in a band and her band was there on the ground sending up a video of them singing. So we, we decided we would just sing along and have some fun in space. Um, when we're not goofing off, when we're not doing work and not looking out the window, we actually exercise. Exercise is hugely, hugely important in space. We're scheduled two and a half days, or two and a half hours each day to exercise. This is me on the device that, that we used um, as if it were um, weightlifting. It's actually resistive exercise. We use resistance instead of weights because weights aren't going to do you any good in space since you don't really have them. So um, that is hugely important. It's because of that machine that I came back with essentially no bone loss. Exercising your muscles, doing the stretch from your muscles to your bones, keeps your bones healthy. We do a lot of running. Uh, your heart's a muscle, you gotta keep that in shape too. So we uh, do a lot of running and the treadmill is on the wall like that and we have the harness to strap us down to keep us on the treadmill. We also have an exercise bike. This is another um, uh, you know, cardio exercise thing. And you can see on the bike, uh, you don't need a helmet and you don't even need a seat, you just lift your feet and, and go. <laughs> Um, once you're done with all that exercise, yes, you are hot and sweaty. Yes, you do sweat in space. I get that question a lot. Um, it doesn't sort of run down. It just kind of falls all around you and it's kind of rather annoying. So you've got to get cleaned up. There is no shower in space. There is no running water in space. So um, 
getting cleaned up is a little, is a little challenge. We use things uh, uh, to, uh, akin to baby wipes to clean our skin, and that does a pretty good job at washing your hair. Washing your hair is a bit more of a challenge. The guys that have short hair definitely have it, um, that definitely have it better. So this is this is me washing my hair in space. It, it is a process. We've got dry shampoo like hospitals use. They say it's no rinse. I can assure you, you definitely want to rinse that stuff out of your hair, otherwise your hair is going to be totally stiff and, and really icky feeling. So you get the shampoo on, you sort of rub it around, you get some water in there, rub it around, and then you just take a towel and try and, and wipe it out as best you can, and then I would then I would have to get another round with the water. <laughs> So there's no hair dryers in space either. So you just have to do as best you can to sort of get it all the way you need to do it, and, and then just just call it a day and say yes, I am space beautiful. <laughs> months it was time for us to come home and so we said goodbye to our friends and it was our turn to get in the sleighs and come home. So uh, Sasha Kaleri shut the hatch behind us, we backed away from the station. Um, this is a view of us backing away, it looks a lot like the one coming in but it's, it's essentially the same going backwards. We get farther and farther from the station and after we undock three and a half hours later we are home. We do come in underneath a parachute, um, it is a very, very dynamic ride. Um, and it's a very, very sporty time when you hit the ground. You are, it is a car crash, I, I will not uh, sugarcoat it, it's, it's quite a whack once you get the ground. The capsule, in our case, rolled over on its side, so the Russians, the search and rescue team, the Russian search and rescue team that comes to meet us, rolls the capsule over to the right orientation so they can then open the hatch and, and get you out. Uh, they do some medical checks, they take us over, They they sit us in chairs, uh, make sure we're all okay, and then we do some more formal medical checks. That's the three of us there. It was below freezing when we got out, but it was actually pretty nice to feel some cooler after coming in at the really, really hot um, hot entry, hot capsule. The capsule does heat up a lot. Um, it's an impressive, impressive time coming in. Um, once we're done, it's a bit like for the Americans, planes, trains, and automobiles to get home. We stick us in an uh, all-terrain vehicle, the ATV in the background there. They drive us over to helicopters. We get on the helicopters. We fly to an airport. Uh, this is in the middle of Kazakhstan. We fly to one of the we helicopter over to an airport that's at a city in the Kazakhstan. We get on a plane, and we come home. And so I was home back in Houston. Uh, roughly 24 hours, almost to the minute, 24 hours after I landed in Kazakhstan, which is, in my mind, pretty impressive. So that, in a nutshell, is living on space station, what we do, how you live up there. Um, this picture I like just because it shows you a much better view of what it's like to be in the Soyuz capsule uh, once it's loaded with all the cargo. That's the three of us uh, just before we came home. So um, that's basically what I wanted to say. I, Thank you for your attention, and I'm absolutely happy to take questions if people have questions about life in space. Yeah, lots of questions. Let's start here. Mic it or shout loud. Yeah. Okay. Uh, obviously, you are uh, very prepared for space in the yes. and you said that on the way up, it takes about two days to put a dot. Yes. Are you in that orientation for the entire two days? No, we're actually not, um, although it's not a whole lot better. The, the Soyuz, when you're launching, has two compartments, and this is a picture taken from what would be considered the upper compartment. It's a little bit bigger. It's got more cargo in it. It's where your food is and more important where the toilet is. Uh, so we are able to get out of our seats, get out of our suits, get into regular clothes, um, and spend the time sort of between the two compartments during that two days. Yes. It's a little behind you with a question and then the Okay, yes ma'am. Why did the spaceship launch at the night time? Why did it launch at night time? That is a good question. It launched at night time because it needed to line up with where the space station was at the time the space station was going overhead. And on that particular day, the space station was going overhead in the middle of the night and that's why we launched at night time. Oh, why was there a table in space? Why was there a table? It's actually good to have some place to put your food. Your food packets do have Velcro on them. Uh, you don't need to hold everything in your hands all the time or wear it on your clothes. We do have Velcro on our clothes, but it's nice to sort of put things down and get them out of the way and have sort of a sense of normalcy while you're there. 
Okay, so <laughs> there's a lot of hands going on. Um, this gentleman is close by here first, and then this gentleman here, and then was it you, Lily? We'll come up to Lily. And yes. Usually, usually huh? yeah. No, go ahead, Doug. Do you okay. generate your own oxygen containers or your CO2 containers by heating them, or do you always bring pressure on the earth? Uh, no, we actually do. And the question was about uh, regenerating our atmosphere. We do have uh, CO2 scrubbers on board, both on the U.S. side and the Russian side, and so we do take that CO2 and uh, we do heat it up and put oxygen back in the atmosphere. And in fact, um, before anybody asks, we do recycle our waste into drinking water. So um, we've got a pretty good system for that as well. So, Usually, how difficult is it to fall asleep and how many hours is scheduled for sleep each night? Okay, good, good question. I do not have any problem with sleeping. We are, in my mind, so busy up there that by the time it was time for me to go to bed, I was ready to sleep. We are scheduled for eight and a half hours of sleep a night. I actually was uh, participating in a sleep study and they said I got between five and five and a half hours a night. And that's because our days are so busy. Anything you want to do on, um, on a personal level comes at the expense of sleep. If you want to email your family, if I wanted to call my mom, if I want to talk to my husband, and you know, he was pretty glad when I called, uh, that would actually come out of my scheduled sleep time. And so I would get a lot less sleep than we were perhaps scheduled for. Um, we do actually operate on Greenwich Mean Time, and so uh, our scheduled sleep time would start at 9.30, and we were scheduled to wake up at 6 in the morning, Greenwich, and that's how our day was organized. It looks like some of your male colleagues had very short hair at the end of their four and a half month stays, so in case they probably cut it. Uh, can yes. you describe that? Yeah, the cutting the hair, if you guys are familiar with the, um, the gadget called the Flowbee, that's kind of what it was like. So we have uh, regular clippers like you have, uh, like uh, males use at the barber, on the ground, but we also attach a vacuum cleaner hose to it to make sure that all that hair that is, that is coming off when it's being cut gets sucked into a vacuum cleaner because the last thing you want is a big cloud of hair going everywhere, getting in your eyes, getting into the filters, I mean, it would be a huge mess. But yeah, they, the guys did cut the hair, I chose not to because, quite frankly, I didn't want those guys cutting my hair. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have a question up here from Taylor. What is it like on the moon? You know, I wish I knew what it was like on the moon. <laughs> we haven't had people on the moon in far too long, so maybe one day I can answer that question. But right now I can't tell you. I've only been to the International Space Station. So, did you have a question? Or? Yes. What kind of food do you, are you able to bring up? What kind of food station? are we able to bring up? Um, a lot of our food is like camping food. If you've ever gone camping and had dehydrated food, it's a lot like that. And then some of it is in little foil packages. We actually have, I wouldn't say it's an oven, but a, we call it a food warmer. We stick the packages in, they touch a, a hot element, and they do heat up. And so we've got um, food that's not dehydrated, food that is dehydrated. But I'll tell you what I missed a lot is none of the food has a whole lot of texture. We don't have anything like potato chips. Um, or anything crunchy because crunchy food makes a lot of crumbs and you don't want crumbs going about in the, in the space station getting into your eyes, getting into the filters. So we kind of have a lot of mushy, mushy food. And I think this, uh, right here in front of you, Kelly. Oh, no, no, the, the gentleman in the white. Let's mix it up. Okay. <laughs> um, so, how, how, what was the ratio, two questions, what was the ratio for the water, how many liters or gallons of water per day per person. And given that there were six of you there for you know three months before the new Soyuz capsules come in, mm -hmm. how much water and food was actually brought up by each you know by each capsule? Right, so um, in terms of water, um, we do recycle our so we're making water up there. We're taking our urine and make it into water. We actually have about, I don't know, a 70% reclamation weight rate. We also take the humidity out of the atmosphere, make it into water. So we don't have to take up a whole lot. I think they plan for about, oh gosh, two and a half gallons a day maybe per person. So they don't, they, they don't, water is not a limiting factor um, because they don't want you to get dehydrated or anything. So, and because it's so easy for us now to recycle it, we can just, essentially have all, all the water we need for our food and for drinking. Uh, food, they kind of stockpile food, 
before we get there. A lot of it came up on the on the shuttle missions because they've got a much bigger cargo uh, capability. They put it up there and we just store it until we eat it. So on our soybeans, I don't think anything came up um, actually food-wise except what we were going to eat on the soybeans itself. There's a lot of food stuff, uh, which is another problem with food because you know it, can, they need to, it needs to be able to last a couple of years after they make it before you might eat it. So that that's also not good with food. Josh, you have a question over here. Um. What's it like when you re-enter the atmosphere after being in zero gravity? Yeah, good question. Re-entering the atmosphere. So uh, once you actually hit the ground, um, which is a big shock to the system, getting out, uh, because we exercise so much, we actually feel pretty strong. We didn't have any problems walking around. Uh, the biggest difficulty is with your inner ear. Your inner ear is what gives you balance. And because it hasn't um, experienced gravity in a while, it is very confused. And so you're very dizzy. Um, and it's hard to walk a straight line, to be completely honest, and, and that lasts a while. Um, and it can actually make people feel nauseous. Um, I was lucky that that didn't happen to me, but it, it, it's kind of a very bizarre, this dizziness that will go away a lot. What was the biggest challenge you faced while on the space station? On the space station, not a whole lot. Um, our training prepares us very, very well for um, what we're going to experience out there. We did have a time where collectively, I would say the entire program had a big challenge because we actually had a pump fail on the outside of the space station which, which controlled the cooling for half the space station. So it was, um, we were planning to do a spacewalk about a week later when it failed. We had to completely um, retool and we ended up doing three spacewalks uh, to repair and to replace that pump. So that was a big challenge collectively, mostly for the people on the ground who had to figure out a way to how we're going to do this. For us, it wasn't so hard to execute. I mean, it was it was challenging to do things that you've never trained for, but the basic training we get was good enough to, to figure that out. In training, I'll tell you, the biggest challenge was um, um, the Russian language. I do not have a gift for languages, and trying to go to class and uh, take tests in a foreign language is, is, is hard for me. Um, how do you know what time it is? Hey, I had a watch. I had this watch, in fact. So we set our watches to Greenwich Mean Time, so which is about six hours ahead of the U.S. time and about four hours behind Moscow time and I don't know how many hours, eight hours off of Japanese time. And um, So we set our watch to that. The ground sends us a schedule every day and we just execute according to the schedule that they send us. Do we get to watch cartoons? No, Saturday morning is, is station cleaning day, so <laughs> no cartoons for us. It's going to be here. Yeah. There is a second microphone somewhere. But... <laughs> okay. If you had wanted to go on the space shuttle, would you? Oh, I wouldn't mind of going on the space shuttle, but um, uh, for me, the the program and my bosses needed me to fly on the, the Soyuz, and I was perfectly happy to do that. I would fly on whatever opportunity they gave me. Okay, this gentleman in front of you. I, I, you can, yeah. you can uh, about what proportion of the time would you be spending outside the station as opposed to inside? Like, how often did you uh, I guess get to go outside? Uh, hardly ever. Uh, spacewalks are incredibly difficult and they're very dangerous, and so they don't do them unless you absolutely have to. Um, as I said, on our, our particular time of the six months, we had one spacewalk planned, we ended up doing three, so not very much. And each of those spacewalks last seven or eight hours. So, a good day with that uh, On the actual space station, is there strict sense of subordination like in the Army, who's in charge, and how exactly is it executed? Is there ever a conflict? Uh, no. Um, well, I suppose there could be. Um, we didn't have any conflict. You actually do have a commander of the space station whose role is basically um, uh, I won't say they're in charge because really the ground is in charge. The ground tells you what your what your duties are for each day, and so you you execute. I suppose if you mutiny and decide you're not to do what the ground wanted, that would be a different thing, and the, the commander would have to deal with you. But um, by and large, we are all professionals. We're not not strict military. It's a civilian organization, even though we do have military people that are astronauts and cosmonauts. Um, but mostly, you just do what you need to do for your Trying to do on the space station. 
You say you brought your watch up with you. Um, how much control do you get over like personal possessions that you can bring with you? Are you allowed to bring like one or two pounds, or is that just? Uh, so it's very little, actually. Most of everything is provided. The watch is one of the few things that we can take up. Um, when we had the shuttle, we had more latitude because they do have a lot more capability to launch a mass into the space station. But right now, um, very little you can take. You have room for maybe a few pictures, maybe uh, a big Ziploc bag full of stuff, and that's about it. And, and the hard part is if you wanted to bring any of it home, because the shuttle, lots of room to bring stuff home. The Soyuz, it's just that one capsule that comes back, and they've got it filled with other stuff. So there's not, not a lot of room to bring stuff back. Yeah. 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 There's just one over here. The, yeah. the microphones will help us control the audio. Okay. Um, you said that most of the time you're getting instructions from people down on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, do you get a chance to be one of those people and then you kind of there, you have to get chosen to go up, or how does that work? Um, yeah, that's a good question. The, there is an entire flight control team on the ground, actually, in all over the world, because we've got Russian flight controllers, we've got Japanese flight controllers, Canadian flight controllers. Um, and of course, the U.S., actually, in two places in the U.S., we've got the controllers in Houston that are, that are uh, worrying about this, the space station itself, and then we've got a control center in Huntsville, Alabama, that, that are the focal point for all the science that we do. So. Um, so the, the question is yes and no. I actually did work as a flight controller, and I worked as what we call a CAPCOM. That's a, a term from the old, old Apollo Mercury days, capsule communicator. So I was the person in the control center that would talk to the crew. You don't have everybody yelling at you at one time saying, do my stuff. It's sort of a very organized affair. Much more, much more militaristic in that sense, because you do have a big boss there that, that hurts everybody. Um, so that was one of my duties before I flew. Um, when you're not training for a, a space flight, you do have duties within the astronaut office. Some of them are things like Capcom. Um, right now, since I'm an expert on the Soyuz, I deal a lot with the Soyuz launches and landings. And in fact, next week, I'll be going over to Russia uh, to work with the Russians on the, the Soyuz landing that's coming up in about two weeks. Um, so it, it just depends on what your job tasks are that you might, might have a, that type of job. Sophie, Andrew, and then this um, what did they do to prepare you, like psychologically, for the um, for the trip up? And did you have any like breakdowns? Um, <laughs> no, no breakdowns. Uh, nobody on my crew had any breakdowns. What did they do to prepare you? Um, a lot of it. Um, we do have uh, some training and some classes on sort of what to expect. Um, most of it is geared towards uh, the separation side of the house. You're not going to be with your families. Um, for a long time and not be able to talk to them when you want to. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? You know, you've got to be the type of person that can kind of find their own happy place in, in whatever situation. So a lot of it is um, driven by yourself to prepare. I will say after three years of, of training and spending half that time overseas somewhere else, I was very well prepared in that sense to uh, be away from my family on the, on the space station. Um, I saw on the poster out there that said you studied uh, flaw. Philosophy and physics. What exactly does that mean? Uh, the, actually, that's the name of the degree. Um, um, it really has nothing to do with philosophy. I studied. Um, uh, well, I suppose like, uh, maybe that. But I, I studied space physics, so I actually looked at how the solar wind, the wind coming off the sun, uh, would interact with the atmosphere of Venus. And Andrew, can you give it to the gentleman in front of you with a striped shirt? And then Ben, this. What special items did you request to be brought up on any part of flights while you were up there? Uh, didn't I don't have any? I don't have any. Sorry. So. Um, when you were like you said you could communicate with like your family and send emails and stuff. Does it take like a long amount of time for the message to like transmit uh, like back to Earth or? Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Email does not take that long, but. It's not a constant thing. You actually have to have the right satellite coverage to get the email to come up and down, and then somebody on the ground has to actually say, okay, we're going to sync your mail. And so they would do that three times a day. So I would get email three times a day. Did you ever use ham radio? I did, yes. We do have a ham radio, so we are able to talk to people via What's ham radio. What's your call sign? Uh, no. On station, you use the station call sign, which is NA1SS. Um, but my KD5DXB is my actual personal. Gentlemen, you already sure? And we'll come back on here. Yes. How do you see hurricanes? How do we see 
see the hurricanes, we actually have a lot of windows on the space station, so we're able to look out the window and see them. And because we're so high up, we can see the entire hurricane at one time and take those pictures. For those of us who are uh, past elementary school and aspiring to follow in your footsteps, uh, what advice would you give to help guide us along the way? Yeah, what advice I give, so if you are still in school, um, you need to study math and science, uh, something like that, engineering. Um, if you're going out into the workforce, my advice is to do something you like. There's not one particular job path that's going to get you there. Do something you're passionate about because if you're passionate about it, you're going to enjoy it. If you enjoy it, you're going to excel at it. And that's how you're going to be um, differentiated from, from other people. So um, if you want to be an astronaut, it, you're going to have to be in a math, science, engineering, technical, medicine type field. But if you want to work at NASA, uh, we use lots of engineers, but we also take people, need people from the whole gamut of, of professions, from doctors to lawyers to, to photographers and all kinds of things. So there's a lot of ways to participate in the program, but just do what you like, and that's the best way to get noticed. What did you play in the mob? Uh, French horn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, a, not exactly a typical marching band instrument. <laughs> Okay, so we'll have Clara, oh sorry, this little boy and then Clara and then the last question over here. Oh, maybe two more, okay. You can bear with this. Is four, oh, four more okay. questions. Okay. Yes, sir. Do you have smoke detectors? Do we have smoke detectors? You bet we have smoke detectors. We have smoke detectors all over. But the interesting thing is the smoke detectors all need fans to run because if you don't have fans moving your atmosphere around, the smoke's not going to get to the smoke detector and they'll never know if you have a fire. So all the fans are in, in front of a fan. If you change the batteries every day, I say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, clear up and over here. Um, when you were like eating and stuff, would you have separate like drinks or was it supplemented like in your food? Uh, and if you did have it like in a separate drink, how did you keep it from like floating around like out of the cup? Right, so we don't have cups. If you remember from, um, so it is separate, we have food and we got drinks. Um, if you remember from my washing the hair, I had this silver bag full of water. That is what a drink bag looks like. And so it could either be water or it might have, uh, if you're a coffee drinker, it would dehydrate coffee in there or tea or juice, something like that. Milk, tea, 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 milk. So as a mom, I'm really curious to know how you did laundry, but we'll still say that for another time. It's all disposable. You don't need laundry. But I, I'm, I'm curious to know just about your career path. Were you in Physics 101 saying, yeah, I'm going to be an astronaut one day? Or so sometimes we fall into amazing things. Is this something that you fell into, or were you working toward that the whole time? Um, I would say both. I wanted to be an astronaut ever since I was a little girl. And um, I think I was pretty fortunate that nobody ever bothered to tell me that girls couldn't be astronauts, because at the time, girls really weren't astronauts. Um, and so it's something I always wanted to do. I had no idea how to go about it. And when I was in high school, um, there was a selection of shuttle astronauts, and that was actually Tammy Jernigan, that was, was part of that. And I was reading her credentials, and she had had uh, like two master's degrees. And I was like, oh, a master's degree? Well, I can do that. And at that point, I realized, well, maybe I could be an astronaut. And, and kept sort of working towards it, even though I didn't know if I had, quote, the right stuff. Um, and actually, for, for the kids out there and for people to know, um, being tenacious kind of pays off. I wanted to do it. I applied as soon as I was um, eligible according to the rules of engagement. I didn't get selected. I got to the final um, selection round, so I got to the interview phase. I wasn't selected. That happened five more times before I was selected over a period of 14 years. So I just kept um, working and, and running myself and doing things I liked. I mean, I never had a job I didn't like and always was, felt very fortunate working at the Johnson Space Center my whole career. One final question. Okay. How did you brush your teeth? Oh, oh. How do I brush my teeth? No. Just like a regular toothbrush, you don't need quite as much toothpaste and you have to spit into a towel or swallow. Your voice is a lot higher than I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> so one, last, one last question. Um, so, obviously, uh, working so closely with the Russians and going up on the Soyuz, um, you're at least fairly proficient in Russian. Uh, did you study Russian before you were accepted in the space trip? into the astronaut program, or was that something that you started studying after being accepted? I uh, did not, well, I started studying Russian when I worked with the Russians before I was selected. 
I did year, live a year in Moscow doing avionics integration on the, on the space station, so working with them to get their computer boxes to talk to our computer boxes. Um, at that time was when I started studying Russian, and so I had sort of that foundation before I was selected as an astronaut, and then afterwards I studied a whole lot more. And these days it's, it's, it's a requirement, the new class that, um, that comes in, you don't have to know Russian before you get selected, but you have to have a certain proficiency level um, before they'll say, okay, you're ready to go fly, which is different from Past. Um, so to make my domestic life easier, my daughter has a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you write in space? Did I write? Um, well, I didn't much write with a pencil. Most of the time, I uh, typed on a computer laptop, and so I'd send emails home or or write a journal or something like that. Your blog. You have a blog. Yeah, I did some of it. Yeah, I did. Um, there was some published in the Chronicle, and then some of it. Well, that was fairly uh, exhausting. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe not as exhausting as three years of training. But um, um, again, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great pleasure having you here. I think our younger members really got a kick out of it, and hopefully some of our older members and I did. Please join me again in thanking Shannon for.